We now know how the judge ruled on motions today, but what bearing will those have on the case going forward? And what can we expect further down the road in this trial? 21 Alive producer and reporter John Wagner talks with IU law professor Jody Madeira tonight. In the courtroom today, we found out that the jury would not be taken to the crime scene. And when that was proposed, and we knew that that was going to be a motion, I thought that was really interesting because I guess, uh, you know, this is, um, it's, it's almost like a state park area. It's, you know, just not very interesting. There isn't something totally unique about the crime scene that we know about. Um, what do you think the value would have been taking the jury to that scene? And, and, and what kind of value does that play in, in murder cases? I think when the defense wanted the uh, jury to initially see the crime scene, uh, they felt that it would give the jury a greater understanding of the scene and perhaps uh, understand some evidence presented at trial, you know, how that fit in. Um, of course, it is a state park. It is, uh, I would imagine, like many uh, outdoor areas, uh, fairly remote. And, you know, I think that the defense ultimately withdrew the motion because uh, basically, they wanted to focus on other matters. The prosecution, of course, is going to introduce uh, very detailed information about the layout of the area, uh, perhaps, you know, maps, um, perhaps images from drones, that kind of thing. And so uh, it might not be necessary, the defense felt, for the jury to actually go out there in person. I wanted to move on to another uh, motion that was heard today, and this was about these sketches, uh, two of the the, the sketches I know we've run on our uh, stories about the case several, several times. If you know anything about the case, you've probably seen those renderings. Um, so uh, why might that come into question as to whether or not the jury can see that if we already we have a defendant? Um, it, what, what would be the purpose of arguing whether or not those should be seen now? I think basically that the prosecution is saying, well, number one, uh, they're both considerably different than Richard Allen. They're based on witness recollections. And so the first one in 2017 was uh, based on intelligence they let her found uh, might not be accurate. And so that's why they uh, basically came up with the 2019 sketch. Um, but it could be a, a male from 18 to 40 years old, and it's not very precise. And so uh, that's one thing they're they're worried about whether it's going to sway the jury, confuse the jury. And of course, normally when you introduce evidence in court, you have to authenticate that evidence by witness testimony. And they don't plan on having the witnesses that testified uh, or the I'm sorry, the witnesses who helped to compile the composite sketch there uh, in court to testify. We talked to you earlier this week on the first day of jury selection. And I, uh, I really wanted to bring you this because I had asked you, you know, when we have a crime where three people go into the woods and one comes out, and this is a murder case, uh, we have victims and a defendant, how can we have up to 150 or even more witnesses? And you explained that for us uh, perfectly. And actually today, one of the other uh, motions that was heard was about whether or not we would hear testimony from prison guards, inmates, and police officers uh, about their interactions with Richard Allen. Uh, and it seems like we will hear those, uh, those pieces of testimony, uh, but they'll not be able to talk about whether or not uh, you know, they assume he's guilty, which I think that's understandable, right? Um, yes. But uh, so what do you what, what do you expect we can hear from prison guards, inmates, and those officers uh, that will have bearing on the case? We know that there have been multiple confessions in, between January and March of 2023 by Allen to these crimes. And, you know, the prosecution has said, for example, that there are uh, full confessions in some cases. They've got very uh, incriminating details. And the defense has said, well, wait, you know, there are some elements there that are different than uh, the information that is accurate. And so basically, um, these guards and inmates will be allowed to testify about how Alan has behaved, you know, perhaps about the circumstances in which he made these confessions. I wanted to focus on one of the three we mentioned. We mentioned prison guards and officers, but inmates, I think, is really interesting. Uh, one of my favorite movies of all time is The Shawshank Redemption. And, uh, you know, of course, that story has an, another inmate uh, divulge that, you know, I actually committed this crime, not somebody else. Um, and it's this whole farce, but uh, do we really, uh, do we see a lot of inmate testimony that comes out in, in murder cases, murder trials, uh, that really shifts things, that really uh, sways the opinion of the jury? Is it reliable testimony, I guess is what I'm asking? 
Well, uh, that is actually a really good question, and I think it depends on the case. So when an inmate testifies, of course, you have to establish that the inmate's not being promised anything to testify, that they're not getting you know, good behavior time, that there is not a material advantage that they're receiving. Uh, they're not being obviously compensated, in not, not through money, of course, but through um, you know, additional uh, time off, you know, um, perhaps additional time for recreation, that kind of thing. Uh, so, of course, that's what the defense is going to work on trying to establish that maybe there was some, you know, quid pro quo there uh, for the testimony. But I think that, you know, assuming that's not the case, yes, the, the testimony can be quite relevant and quite helpful because, again, sometimes a defendant who's on trial will make statements to someone who's sharing a cell or someone who, you know, happens to overhear a statement that is very helpful to the prosecution and the case against him. Um, oftentimes, however, uh, that statement might not be accurate in the first place. Again, uh, the defense's contention here is that Richard Allen was in the throes of a mental health crisis, and that and not his culpability for the murder is why uh, he made those confessions. As we've said, this has gone on for so long, for so many years. Uh, and, you know, I think the, the family of the, the families of the girls just want this to come to a close. If there's something that could throw a wrench into the works and prolong this way past what's reasonable, uh, what do you think that might be? Or is that something we'll just have to wait and find out? Well, hopefully nothing goes wrong in the trial that can bog it down. I think things are going to move smoothly and expeditiously. I think that, you know, basically we're going to see uh, the prosecution present their side as cohesively and efficiently as possible. The defense will take a turn and then we're going to wrap this up. Nonetheless, it's going to be about a month long. And I know over uh, the days and weeks and at least the month ahead, I know we'll be talking to you a few more times, Jody. Uh, thank you so much for being with us again tonight on the News at 7. Thank you.